So for this morning, Psalm 84, if you want to turn there. Psalm 84, Old Testament. You've got a Bible open. Yeah. It goes like this. starts off like this. For the director of music, according to Gitteth, whatever that is, of the sons of Korah, a psalm. Here we go. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh cry out for the living God. Just in my notes, in a quiet time, I, I wish I could date when I write these things. Because I've had this Bible like almost 20 years. I wrote at the bottom of this where it says, My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. I've made an annotation in my Bible. I just said, am I often enough in this place? Where I cry out for God. Okay. Verse 3, even the sparrows found a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may have her young. A place near your altar, O Lord Almighty, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you who have set their hearts on pilgrimage. Underline this in my Bible with two different colors. As they pass through the valley of Baca, or the valley of tears, or the valley of weeping, as they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. I just want to pause there. It's a beautiful psalm. And at this point in time, most of us have moments in our lives where we dread things happening, hey, certain things that may happen to us. The Valley of Baca, we dread going through it. But I want to just remind you two things from this passage. The first is, it says we may pass through the Valley of Baca, but we don't stop there. It's not your residence. It doesn't define you. You pass through. You don't have to stay in the Valley of Baca. You can, you can pass through. You should pass through. Second thing I want to say is, it's not always your Valley of Baca that you go through. It could be someone else. And because you've already been through yours, you're able to help them, walk with them, pass them through it, that the place of tears becomes a place of springs and wells and living water. Be encouraged that you don't always get stuck in the place where you find yourself. God can and does bring us through. He talks about we pass through this place. Verse 8, hear my prayer, O Lord God Almighty. Listen to me, O God of Jacob. Look upon our shield, O God. Look with favor on your anointed one. And then this is the text for today. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. We'll explain that now. now. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. O Lord Almighty, blessed is the man who trusts in you. The psalmist is reflecting on the joy of being in God's house. And there are two things in the psalm that are important to him. The first is he's delighting in who God is. And secondly, he's delighting in what God gives. So who he is and what he gives. Now in the ancient world, I'm sure you know this, all these pagans had idols. And they believed that the deity lived within the idol. And that's why if you desecrated an idol, they sought you out. In those days, they literally believed that the deity inhabited the idol. It's a mockery, because remember, Satan has nothing original. He can only copy. He can't originate. He's not a creator. He can't make something. He can only copy and falsify. We know that Jesus took on the Son of God, the Word of God, took on human flesh and lived among us. God inhabits His people. So what they believe is that these deities come and inhabit these idols. And so, in the same way, the God of Israel inhabited the temple and the Holy of Holies within the temple. But remember, God's physical address isn't Jerusalem. It isn't a temple. God's dwelling place is heaven. But He allows His manifest presence to be in a place, the temple. But you also know that when you read your history, after David and Solomon, when Solomon's son Rehoboam took over the kingdom... He made, Jeroboam, he took a, made a huge mistake. And what he did was he allowed the worship of idols. I, I always forget their names. There's Jeroboam and Rehoboam. And the other one took the northern kingdom and put false gods in place. And what did God do? He says, I'm lifting my presence. I'm lifting my, my place from, the, from there. 
I will not share my glory with this lot that are behaving like this. That's what he did. Because they knew that God inhabits everything, but he has a place. And he chooses to live in that place. And Jesus said that that place, that temple, is called my father's house in John 2 verse 16. So uh, I start back in Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints for the courts of the Lord. What's he talking about? To go to the temple is to seek the presence of God. The temple cannot contain him because he's bigger than that, but he's found there. And then we all know that around AD 66, the temple was destroyed. And then Jesus says, our bodies become the new temple in which God lives. In other words, when people out there want to find God, they either have to come to a church where truly Jesus is worshipped. Like this morning, didn't you love the worship? I think for me it's the highlight of the day. This preaching, was, you can go. But the worship, because worship is God-centered. Preaching is this centered. Worship is Him-centered. If we're, going to do, if we're going to choose between preaching and worship, rather go for worship. Rather go for prayer because it's God-centered. Are you with me? And when, when I'm telling you, like this morning, the Lord inhabits the praises of His people. The only way you did not enter the presence of the Lord this morning is because you chose not to. Because you're either distracted or something. But His presence is here. He always, the Bible says, in, just same as you ask for forgiveness that He forgives you, is the same way He inhabits the praises of His people. And so you become a living temple, which means if people want to encounter God, they either come to a church where Jesus is truly worshipped, or they come to you. And they ought to find the presence of God around you and I. And that's where we're going to go in this thing this morning. We are God's temple. And our longing, according to Psalm 84, should be for the God who dwells there. The psalmist is using words like, my heart, my flesh cry out. I'm fainting for the courts of the Lord. It's his whole being. His soul is his self. His heart is his mind. His flesh is his humanity. He's engaged and he says, I cry out. That verb, to cry out, means to shout or to give a ringing cry. It's a desperation for God. And then he says, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. In other words, he's saying the quality of time spent with you is far better than the quantity. Because there are people who, I have my quiet time. There are people who've had quiet times for 15 years. They look like they've never seen Jesus. Huh? They act like they've never seen him. They do all the religious stuff, but nothing ever changes in their lives. There's none of them in this church, but they're in other churches. You know those people. I'm 20 years saved. Can't you see? No, we can't. You look like a miserable old lemon sucker. It's not the quantity. It's not your length of years. It's being in the presence of a God who can change you and I. You know what the great news is that we sang about this morning? We're all broken, useless, sinful people who mess it up all the time, who go to a living God who forgives and loves and restores us. There's no better news. Saying I can't become a Christian because of the Christians is like saying I can't go to gym because of the fat people. Huh? Why, why are the fatties in gym in the first place? To get into better shape, to not see the doctor so often. Why do we go to church that Jesus can change us into his presence and we can get rid of the stuff that it's all around us? Are you hearing me? Good. It's the quality of our lives. And to be a doorkeeper, the word is, if you're a doorkeeper in some place, you are literally on the threshold of the dwelling place. In other words, you're about to step into something. So I highlighted in green in, on, on my notes. What are you on the threshold of in your life in 2022? 2024, sorry. <laughs> Whatever. My brain's still in Lesotho. So is my friend's arm. <laughs> the whole of him. His bike's still there. So, what are you on the threshold of? What whispers has God been speaking to you? Where does he want adjustments? What things, you have a current relationship with a God who inhabits your life. What's he doing? What's he saying? When you look forward to the rest of this year, what is God doing? What does he want to do in that temple he purchased with his own blood? Your body. What is God nudging in your spirit? 
You see, when you find yourself in the presence of the Lord, it's the place where God reveals himself. Isaiah 6 verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted. The train of his robe filled the temple. I believe the church is being renewed today. Everywhere I go, God is knocking on the door of the church and he's doing real things. And I want to say that where he is, I believe, in worship and in service, I believe God wants to reveal his grace and his glory to his people. God wants to be present. God wants to be here. Not just one we worship who's far away. He inhabits his temple. And that's where the psalmist is going. I want to tell you when Jesus is here, we can be saved, healed, delivered. We can be ministered to because he knows our innermost beings more than we do. What was the role of a doorkeeper or a gatekeeper back in Israel's day? In the temple of Jerusalem. Just quickly. They guarded the temple of the Lord. They opened and closed them in proper times. 1 Chronicles 9. And they prevented the unclean from entering the sacred enclosure. Not just anyone could wander in. The second thing they did was they stood guard over the storerooms and the treasuries to make sure that nothing got stolen from there. Because people would bring in a whole lot of offerings and very expensive stuff. And the third thing they did was they, they stood guard at the entrance. A constant reminder that communion with God is a privilege and not a right. In other words, nobody has the right to just wander into God's presence whenever you like. You come God's way. You come the way God wants you to come. Do you remember in the Garden of Eden, there was no doorkeeper to the presence of God. Adam and Eve enjoyed the presence of God until Adam sinned. Then a doorkeeper was put in place to prevent the unclean from coming in. You see it in Genesis 3.24. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of, tree of life. Yet in his grace, God continually calls unholy people to himself. But there's a way that those unholy people have to approach him, and that's what we're going to celebrate over this next weekend. There's a way to approach the Lord. And God is kind. Even Moses could come close to God, but when, when God revealed himself to Moses, take your shoes off, this is holy ground. Moses could come so close to God and God had to hide Moses in the cleft of a rock. We know that God said to him, bring Israel close to me, but in bringing them close to my, to my mountain, put a, a line around. They can't come closer. There's always a separation between man and God because of God's holiness. Then we need to figure out how do we get there. And so for God in the wilderness and then in the temple, for God to dwell among his people required an act of incredible grace on God's part. No human being can approach God without God giving him permission to do so. Are you all right? Then in Numbers 3, the Lord sets apart the tribe of Levi to help the priests. In 1 Chronicles 9, we read that Phinehas, the grandson of Aaron, the brother of Moses, was in charge of the gatekeepers. Verse 19 says that they guarded the entrance to the dwelling of the Lord. Now you can understand the significance of Phinehas in Numbers chapter 25. Do you remember when they're in the wilderness and they still said, God said, you don't mix with the, with the ungodly people nearby. One guy goes and falls in love with a Midianite chick, brings her into the tent, into the house of the Lord, into the people of the Lord, goes into the tent with her. And listen, they weren't just talking because Phineas got a bit annoyed. So he went in with a spear, the Bible says, and pegged them both to each other on the ground. So I don't know what they were doing. But the spear goes right through both of them. And Phineas stopped the judgment of God and the curse of God going upon the, the nation. This is hectic. He turned away God's wrath. And in 1 Chronicles 9, Samuel assigns gatekeepers to a position of trust. Remember, Samuel himself had been a gatekeeper as a little boy. Remember, his job was to open and close the temple under Eli with his bad boys. And so Samuel puts gatekeepers to protect the holiness of the tabernacle. And remember then when David says the ark of God needs to come back to the people of God. Remember. And Uzzah goes and touches the, uh, the, the, the cart that the ark is being carried on. He falls dead. Remember. Then they take the ark of God, David, and they go and put it in the house of a guy named Obed-Edom. It stays there for three months and blesses his house, the presence of God. By the way, Obed-Edom is the descendant of Korah. So he too, where am I? Uh, I'm going ahead of my, yeah. So he too was a gatekeeper. And then David goes and allows 
4,000 Levites. So this is a bit of an overkill. But he allows 4,000 Levites to protect the temple day and night. There's only one door, but let's have all of these people. So then David appoints the sons of Korah to become, listen, David appoints the sons of Korah to become the gatekeepers or the doorkeepers of the temple of the Lord. That brings the psalm back full circle. When I started it, what did I say? This psalm was written by the sons of Korah. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God. By the way, there's no noun in that Hebrew. In other words, I would rather doorkeep. It's a doing word. I doorkeep. I do something. I'm stationed at the threshold of my God. There's hectic irony in this psalm. Who are the sons of Korah? Do you remember Numbers chapter 16? Korah leads a rebellion in the wilderness where Korah says, you know what? Anyone can burn incense before God. Anyone can come before God. Moses and Aaron and Miriam, you're not special. We can all do it. 250 people join with him. We're all equal. Who do you think you are? And then God says he's going to judge. So, so Moses tells the people, move away from them. Now they're sitting with their tents like this. All the people move away. The ground opens, swallows them up and closes again. That's Korah. Somehow, these kids don't die. So God goes and he allows Korah's children, Numbers 26 verse 11, he allows Korah's children to make it their life's work to prevent the sin of their father from happening again. You see, Korah wanted anyone to be able to access God at any time regardless of God's requirements. There are churches today. There are people today preaching. Anyone can come to God the way they want without having to go through the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. You don't need that. There's any way in. How many times at a funeral do you hear? I think he was a Christian. Why? He had a Bible in his house. So if you've got a garden and home in your house, are you now a horticulturalist? Come on. No, I think he's a Christian. Why? Well, you know, he's not Jewish or Muslim. He must be. All roads lead to. That's Korah. And God said there's a way, and the only way, we're going to celebrate this next week, the only way to God is through the broken body and the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not all come. So what God does is He so redeems the situation where Korah wants to lead the people into sin and got judged for his rebellion. God allows Korah's children to restore the presence of God, to the people of God. And that's why they say, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Who's he referring to? The tents of the wicked is his own father with the nonsense they were up to. I'd rather dwell in the courts of the Lord than live there, was his choice. Are you okay? So he has a question, who... What is it? What is what? What if you were to look at someone, you say, okay, that's a doorkeeper in the house of God. Psalm 84. What would be the first and most obvious sign of a doorkeeper? Psalm 24, verse 3. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who doesn't lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what's false. He will receive blessing from the Lord, vindication from God his Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, a God of Jacob. The first and most obvious sign of a doorkeeper, someone who stands on the threshold of God's things, is a person who seeks the Lord's face, who seeks his presence, his will, his direction. It was also the role of a doorkeeper to wait for the true king of Israel to come to the temple. Psalm 24 verse 7. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Psalm 24 verse 7. When was that? That psalm was fulfilled today, 2,000 years ago, when Jesus the king, riding on a donkey, went straight into Jerusalem, and the people shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The true king of Israel finally arrived in Jerusalem on Palm Sunday 2,000 years ago. Many praised, many worshipped, many didn't understand that this king, which we'll talk about this next week, this king had to die. But he fulfilled that psalm. Can I just say, when he entered the city, 
Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is you who comes in the name of the Lord. What did Jesus do when he arrived in there? Hey? Everyone's celebrating him. And he finally arrives in Jerusalem. What did Jesus do? First thing he did was made a whip and went into the temple and chased out all the money changers, all the people. And he said, my house will be a house of worship and a house of prayer for all nations. The first, when you know when Jesus has come into your life because he sorts out the temple, he sorts out what's going on in the inside. And we'll all mess it up from time to time and we all need his presence to come and restore us from time to time. Doorkeepers, by the way, aren't always good. You see in, chapter, in John chapter 7, the doorkeepers are the temple God. The Pharisees send them to go and arrest Jesus. They're the ones who lay a hold of him. The very doorkeepers whose job is to welcome in the king, the Levites, whose job is to welcome in the king of kings, are the very ones who arrest the king of kings, pay money to Judas, and take him to his trial that the Romans can sort him out. Just because you're a doorkeeper doesn't mean you're in a good place. You can be a doorkeeper in tradition. And not even know the presence of God when he's standing right in front of you. They were among the crowd that arrested him. They sat it with Peter at the fire. Interestingly, Phineas, to take the wrath of God away from Israel, went into a tent with an Israelite man and a Midianite woman. And he put a spear through both of them and he stopped the wrath of God from coming into the tent. Later on, the king of glory came. And he didn't kill an a, 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 a Israelite and a Midianite. He allowed himself to be killed. He allowed himself to be crushed so that the wrath of God would not come upon humanity. In that way, Jesus was so much greater. And we all know he is the gate. He, the doorkeeper, the original doorkeeper is the Lord Jesus. So I want to ask this. He's the, he's the gate for the sheep, right? He says, so I'm the true gate, I'm the door, etc., etc. So now I want to close by asking this question. What? would a doorkeeper look like? If you and I want to be doorkeepers in the presence of God, Psalm 84, what does it look like? Number one, doorkeepers are openers. When you think of a gatekeeper, you think of a guard with a lock and a key. They did have to stand guard at night, it's true, but 1 Chronicles 9.27 says they had the charge of the key to open it every morning. Their job was to open the doors for the people of God to access the presence of God. That was their role. The Lord appointed doorkeepers because He wants a house with open gates that His people can come in and be with Him. And if you read the book of Revelation, I think chapter 21, when it talks about the, the, the holy temple in the New Jerusalem, it said, and this gates were open 24 hours. God wants constant open access to his house, to his people. God wants us to be able to access him. And so we are openers. We are those who, who find a way to, there are some people that you will meet that we will never get a hold of. And if they don't get to a church like this where they can hear the good news about Jesus, they're going to have to find it through your life, your testimony, in your workplace, your, workplace, your neighbors. Sometimes the only presence of God they will find is you. When you just humbly share what Jesus has done for you. In your, and you know what? You, you can't say, I'm going to wait till I'm more perfect. You don't have to be perfect. You are a living testimony of the fact that God is at work in you. Because people who know you can see the, the change gradually in your life. And you become a testimony of what Jesus is doing. And so you're an opener. You open conversation. You open the, the way for people to access God. Psalm 118 verse 19, open for me the gates of righteousness. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. Our job is to get the gospel to the world. Friends, we live in a country where I'm told over 84% of people would recognize or say that they are Christian. We don't know what the real stats are. But there are parts of the world where the name of Jesus has never, ever, ever, ever been heard. But Jesus wants his name to be heard. There are people Jesus wants to fellowship with who don't even know he's there. Met a couple this morning, I said, who gave their lives to the Lord at the 8 o'clock meeting. They, I said, how did you find us? They Googled us. They just moved to Dower Glen. So they arrived here last week. 
first meeting. Second meeting was this morning. They both gave their lives to Jesus. Afrikaans. I said, what is, uh, one of the questions I always ask people, what's your background? What's your, I said, no, the guy says, I was Methodist when I was a kid. I haven't been in church since then, 25, 30 years. She says, I have no background of church. Now listen, if there's anyone in this country who knows something of the things of God, it's the Afrikaners. They have this God thing. Whether it's right or wrong, you can't find one that doesn't believe like in God. You know? And these oaks have never, they've no, they have no, no uh, 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 place for him in their thinking at all. Don't you assume that the person walking away from you or walking towards you is in a relationship with Jesus just because we're in a so-called Christian country. And God is longing for every single lost child to come back to Him. Are you okay? I go so far as to say that sometimes there are whole nations of people that call the name of the Lord that it's not even the same Lord. Because the Lord they're claiming would never allow them to do the things they're doing. And you've got to say, okay, we need to just open our hearts again and see, Lord, where are you in this? We've got to get them to come, not stay away. We've got to open doors for this gospel to get out there. We're openness. Number two, we're urgent. Jesus wants fellowship with all of God's creation. In Mark chapter 13, verse 32 to 37, Jesus warns his disciples to stay awake like a doorkeeper, waiting for his master to come home, not knowing when he will arrive. He says, stay awake. Be urgent. I'm longing to come back. Then he gives a warning. Luke 13, 25. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, Sir, open the door for us. But he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. Listen, Jesus warns, on that day, that open door is going to close. And on that day, when that open door closes, you can do what you want on the other side. You're not getting in. When that final trumpet sounds, and the world that's playing with God right now, a world that's going so far astray needs to know that the door's open, but it doesn't remain open forever. Don't lean on God's grace too far. Do you know that repentance, forgiveness of sin, is still real today? You cannot just go and preach, well, He loves everybody. He does love everybody, but not everybody's going to heaven. There is something insidious creeping in the church where we're no longer calling people to bow the knee and surrender to Jesus Christ. We're saying, believe in God, be a good person, it's enough. It's not. You need to bow the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our only hope of salvation. And once Jesus shuts that door, no keeper, gatekeeper will ever open it again. Number three. Number one, we're openers. Open opportunities. Open your mouth. Open your wallet. Open your time. Open your diary for opportunities for people to meet God. Number two, live with an urgency. Understand the urgency of the day we live in. This gospel needs to go out. I mean, how long till Jesus comes back? It can't be too long. Number three, the biggest thing a doorkeeper guards is his own heart. We're gatekeepers of our hearts and our lives. There are unholy influences that come upon us all the time. And you and I need to give the Holy Spirit room to work in our lives. We all need His work. We all need to surrender to Him. I had a friend of mine leading a big church. Speak to another friend of mine who also leads a big church. And the one years ago was saying to the other one, just describing his life, his diary, how busy it is and all the rest, and just talking about the challenges and this and that. And he spoke for about, I don't know how long. And when he had finished, his other friend, who also leads a big church, probably the same size, said to him, I just want to ask you a question. He said, yeah, in leading your church and the busyness of the times you're in, I just want to ask you something. Does Jesus still take your breath away? And my mate started to weep. And he suddenly realized that the business of church can be so overwhelming that you forget that Jesus is your king who loves you so much he still wants to take your breath away. And I want to ask you, the more mature you are as a Christian, the longer you've known Jesus, can I say this? You need to reflect more of his presence in you. Not necessarily his perfection, but you need to demonstrate your willingness and your openness and your surrender 
to His presence in your life every day. Guard your heart. There are things you close your heart to. There are things you open your heart to. Can I throw some out? What are you meant to be, what are you supposed to be letting in to the church? I read this morning in my quiet time, it was 1 Corinthians 12. We all have gifts. We did the whole gifted series. We all have spiritual gifts that the church is meant to benefit, not only on a Sunday with a couple of people here. It's as you interact with people. What spiritual gifts have you got that others are blessed by? We need each other. How are you benefiting others? Because you're meant to be. What are you letting in? What's those beautiful characteristics you have that only you have that we need? Are you opening them up for us? Do you even know what they are? I said this earlier, what are you standing on the threshold of? Number three, are you tending to the Lord? While I was in Australia, we had the um, National Elders Time. And so this group in Balaclava we were working with, I got them to come to the second day when Tyron was sharing. On the first day, can you believe it, Dudley, some of you know Dudley Daniel started our whole NCMI. Dudley at 80 years old got the strength together and he came to 115, 120 pastors throughout Australia in Adelaide and Dudley took the whole day and shared with us and you know what he did he started like this he said those of you in ministry those of you on eldership those of you leading the churches whatever I just want to say to you today your first ministry is to minister to the Lord and then he got, I mean by the end we're all repenting and receiving Jesus as Lord again and all the rest because he just hit us with how is your ministry to the Lord not your ministry to people not your output How's your ministry to the Lord? Because how are you going to minister to people if you're not ministering to the Lord? He took two sessions, made us all cry and beg and ask Jesus back into our lives. It was the most beautiful time. But are you opening your heart to the current activity of the Holy Spirit inside you? Number four, are you a custodian of His presence? Are you aware of the presence of the Lord? Does it the Bible says you're a living letter. The Bible says you're a fragrance. Can I just be honest? When people come near you, they smell. No, not they smell. They sniff. You have a smell. What are they smelling? From your words, your actions, the, just the look on your face. Do you demonstrate someone who just, I love Jesus? I'm not perfect, but I love Jesus. Is that there? Are you an aroma? Do, are you a custodian of His presence? I promise you this. You cannot be a custodian of the presence of the Lord and at the same time be a bitter person who speaks ugly about people. You cannot. It's one or the other. And only you get to decide which one you are. Only you know the state of your heart towards other people. Only you know if there's a generosity of spirit or a silent judgmentalism that tells you that you have pride and a superiority and you're so frustrated because God's never used you to the, uh, to the level of your ability and He will not if your heart isn't clean. It doesn't have to be perfect. It needs to be clean. In other words, I watch what I say. I watch what I think because no one knows except God. Korah had a bad heart. His kids were custodians of the presence of God. And lastly, what could God be asking you to have faith for this year? Hey? As a doorkeeper, a gatekeeper, if you're on the threshold, what could the Lord be asking you to have faith for? Because when you guard your heart, you also take the words he's speaking to you and you put them inside. And you allow those words, faith comes by hearing. You allow faith to brew inside you. Because of the mission God has for you over the next days, weeks, months, and years. What are you brooding over? You know, I'm having some strange quiet times just at the moment. This morning, I woke up, I said to Vanessa, I woke up about three, four times during the night. Because I'm just getting over my jet lag now. I must have woken up at least three times during the course of the night and I found myself praying when I woke up. My spirit was praying. That doesn't happen very often with me. You know, I sleep, I try sleep. You know? 
I find when I do get up is to go to the bathroom. It's not spiritual. I don't think it's age-related. But I do find I'm waking up more often now to go to the bathroom. But I think it's tea. I think tea is a diuretic. I don't think it's age. But I'm just putting it out there. But this was waking up. And when I did, my spirit, I was praying. I was talking to God. And I realized that for where I'm at, he's doing something inside that I'm not even aware of. Because deep calls to deep. Are you a custodian of the presence of God? If so, what is he speaking to you about? Just for your next little season. Because he talks to all of us all the time. And if he's not, maybe get to him. And say, Lord, your sheep hear your voice. I want to hear you. I really want you to talk to me. About me. Because I want to be a blessing. I want to be a doorkeeper. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than live in the tents of the wicked. As a matter of fact, I'd rather even have one day of quality in your presence than a thousand elsewhere. The doorkeepers of the presence of God. Psalm 84, his people. Stand with me, please. Thank you so much for being a part of our meeting today. Um, can I just ask two things? The first is, if today the, the message has in any way been useful to you, would you mind just maybe liking it or putting uh, perhaps a statement down or a comment down that we can know and how the ministry has helped you? Maybe a, a thumbs up, maybe you can subscribe to the channel, do whatever, just so we can know what impact this message may be having on you. And secondly, you may be someone who's saying, Greg, I hear you. And this, this, this hope that Jesus has for us can come into my heart and it can change me. But the reality is that I don't even know if I know Jesus. I want to say two things to you right away. The first is He's near you right now. The Bible says if you believe in your heart that He is the Lord and if you confess Him with your mouth, you will be saved. Which means you just need to, where you are, turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, even now. And just say, Lord, here I am. I recognize who you are. I confess my sin to you. I acknowledge you as Jesus Christ, the Lord of all, the Son of the living God. And I want to follow you. I want to become a disciple of yours. I want to, I want to give my life to you, Lord. And you can pray that prayer right now between you and the Lord. Secondly, you can get hold of us. Um, you can see the telephone number. You can get hold of us and say, hey, I've given my life to the Lord. Can you help me from here on out? And we could either send you some material. We can uh, put you in touch with a really good church near you. If you live in our area, you can come to us. You can follow us on YouTube. But it is good to get connected into the family of God, to get connected into a local church, that your life changes being surrounded with the family of God. Please stay in touch. God bless you.